In this video, we introduce some of the critical issues in the study of the world behind Romans. We are going to divide our video out into four different sections. We're going to talk about who wrote Romans, who our author is, why Romans was written, what the purpose of the letter is, when Romans was written, that is the date of the letter, and for whom Romans was written, the audience of the letter. But before we jump into any of these four categories, we are going to start with a before and after lecture pause. So before I introduce to you any of this information about the world behind the letter of Romans, I want you to uh, complete this sentence. And you can go on and do more than one sentence if you need to. Uh, but before I put any of the information out there, I want you to make a prediction about some of the world behind Romans. So I want you to fill in this, uh, fill in, complete this sentence. Romans is a letter written and think about some of those things, date, audience, author, and purpose of Romans and make a prediction about some of the things we're going to put out there. All right, now that you have made your prediction, I'm going to get some of that information out there. We're going to start with who wrote Romans. The answer here is somewhat simple. We have this man here, the Apostle Paul uh, in Lovis Corinth's image that is the central uh, artistic piece for our class. In Romans 1.1, we get the statement, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So from the very first word of Romans, we have our author indicated as Paul, but it's maybe not as simple as Romans 1.1 would have us believe. We have another statement in Romans chapter 16, which we're going to look at uh, again later on in this video, that mentions another person, namely Tertius, who sends his greetings to the churches in Rome. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you as well. So what we have here is another writer of the letter of Romans. Presumably here we have Paul's scribe, the person to whom he had dictated Romans, or perhaps the person that was copying out another, uh, another version of Romans. That is to say, Paul dictates to Ter Tertius, uh, Tertius writes up the letter of Romans based on Paul's dictation and likely also makes a copy of this very long letter. So Tertius is actually uh, quite involved in, uh, in the production of the letter of Romans uh, based on what we know about how scribes operated in the ancient world. So while Paul is our named author and the person that we, of course, associate with, uh, with Romans, and we sort of often think of Paul as the sole mind behind this letter, that's actually not the case, that we at least, we have at least two different minds working together to create this letter, Paul's and Tertius's. Uh, another name is mentioned in Romans chapter 16. Gaius sends his greetings. Um, Gaius sends his greetings to the churches in Rome. And the reason that Gaius's name is of interest is because another Gaius, or probably better said, the same Gaius, shows up in 1 Corinthians 1.14 in a sort of offhand comment. Paul says, I thank that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. He tells us that he did baptize Crispus and Gaius, who are presumably persons who were in the churches in Corinth. So we have this connection between Gaius, who lives in Corinth, and Gaius, who is sending greetings to the Roman Christians. And what this leads us to uh, sort of, uh, what we can deduce from this is that Paul is writing with Tertius from the city of Corinth, since we have Gaius situated in Corinth and sitting, uh, sending greetings over to Romans. So, who wrote Romans? Paul and Tertius together uh, from the city of Corinth. And knowing that Romans is written from the city of Corinth also helps us with the dating of Romans, which the short answer for this slide here is going to be uh, 56 or 57 CE. So Paul is writing squarely in the middle of the first century. Uh, Romans is probably towards the end of his letter writing career, one of the last 
few letters, last uh, perhaps the last letter, perhaps one of the last uh, two or three letters. But the short answer is Paul is writing uh, in 56 or 57 CE, and perhaps the uh, foremost uh, scholar on the chronology of the New Testament these days, Jonathan Bernier, uh, says that probably no biblical text can be dated as precisely as Romans. So uh, scholars are sort of quite confident about this 56 or 57 CE date, more so than most other books in the New Testament or the Bible at large. And so what I'm going to do is walk us through how we get to this 56 or 57 CE date. And what you notice is that the sort of dating of Romans and the dating of all biblical texts is somewhat of a game of, of Jenga or dominoes, or it's a puzzle where you maybe don't have all the pieces and you're trying to, you're trying to fit things together. Uh, with respect to Romans, we have some more solid evidence than we do for many other letters. Uh, but what you'll see is it's sort of, uh, we're, we're working with a series of inferences here. If this is the case, then and this is the case and we can connect these two things then we can get to this third thing and that will finally get us to the date of 56 to 57 CE. So I tell you all that because I'm going to go through these uh, these dominoes or these Jenga pieces or these puzzle pieces uh, and there's going to be connections between them uh, but it might it might be a little bit confusing as we sort of go down this logical line here. Uh, so what we need to start with is this fact that Paul is writing from Corinth. Uh, so we know where Paul is writing from, which is going to be key to dating when he is writing. So if we can place Paul sort of where he is in his missionary journeys, then we can try and place him in time as well. So we place geography and then we can place the time. So Paul is writing from Greece and uh, we get some information from Acts about Paul's various missionary journeys, but we get information about when he was in Greece in particular. Uh, and we get him in Greece in 51 or 52 CE. The dates 51 or 52 do not come from Acts itself. Acts nowhere says in this particular year, in 51 or 52, Paul was here. But we can get to a 51 or 52 CE date for Paul being in Greece initially. And so this is our first, our first domino, our first Jenga or puzzle piece here. And we get it from Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read these out loud for us. A Acts chapter 18, the first three verses says that after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because the emperor Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. We're going to come back to this, uh, these three verses from Acts again later on, specifically with respect to Claudius ordering the Jews to leave Rome. But what this does is it situates Paul in Corinth. So we know Paul is in Corinth. And then Acts chapter 18, verses 11 through 12, so we've skipped a couple of verses here, tells us that he stays in Corinth for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio excuse me, was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. So this bit about Gallio being proconsul is what helps us get to this 51 or 52 CE date with respect to Paul being in Greece. So Gallio is the proconsul of Achaia, which is uh, which would we now we would now call Greece, the area uh, known as the country of Greece. And the reason that we can get to a 51, 52 CE date for this event in Paul's missionary career is because of this particular inscription. An inscription is letters or uh, a, a message written into stone. Here we have this message written into stone from the emperor uh, Tiberius Claudius. And so what he does is he uh, he says, he, he talks about um, a bunch of different things, but in the inscription, it is mentioned that Gallio is the proconsul. So uh, it, and we can, so we have this connection between Acts 18, Paul going before Gallio, the proconsul, 
and this particular inscription in Delphi of Gallio being the proconsul. And we can securely date this inscription to 52 CE. So what this tells us is that Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia in 52 CE. Um, and if we sort of work with how long proconsuls served their terms, they, they had one year terms that began in July and ended in June. So presuming that uh, the dating of 52 CE is in the first half of 52 CE, uh, Gallio was probably the proconsul of Achaia or Greece from 51 to 52 CE. So because we can date this particular inscription, we can say when Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, and we can place Paul then in Greece in 51 or 52 CE. So this is our first uh, sort of and most concrete starting point for a date. And then we rely on Acts, sort of the further description in Acts, to make a chronology that goes further down the line in the uh, in the decade of the 50s CE. So after Paul is before Gallio in Greece, he leaves for Ephesus and stays in Ephesus for two to three years. Acts uh, is a little bit fuzzy on how long uh, how long Paul was there. One place says two years. One place seems to imply three years. But for two to three years, so somewhere you know around 55 to 56. Uh, or from 52 to 55 or 56, Paul is in Ephesus, staying there. Then Paul, in somewhere around 55 or 56, leaves Ephesus for Macedonia, spends some amount of time in Macedonia. Once again, Acts does not give us a precise amount of time, perhaps a year or so, in Macedonia before Paul travels on to Corinth. And Acts is explicit and says Paul spends three months in Corinth in Acts 20 verse 2. And it is these particular three months that we can situate Paul being in Corinth and writing to the Romans because of that connection uh, with Gaius being mentioned in 1 Corinthians and also being uh, mentioned in the letter of Romans. So all of this to say, and here we have Acts 20 uh, verses 2 through 3, when Paul had gone through these regions, namely the regions of Macedonia, and had given the believers much encouragement, he came to Greece where he stayed for three months. So we have Paul in Greece and Corinth for three months, uh, writing Romans after the Corinthian correspondence. So Paul has dealt with the issues in uh, Corinth and then come to Corinth, stayed there for three months. Um, and in Romans itself, mentions making this collection for Jerusalem that he is going to take on to the city of Jerusalem. He's gathered some money um, and he wants to gather more money in Rome probably and take it on to Jerusalem. And he says in Romans 15 verse 28, so when I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, so when I complete the collection and deliver it, I'll set out by way of you to Spain. So he's going to go to Jerusalem and then go on to Spain. So Paul is uh, where we can sort of situate Romans then is uh, this three month period when Paul is in Corinth and before his final journey to Jerusalem. So in short, Paul writes the letter of Romans in 56 or 57 CE uh, while he is in Corinth and before he goes on his final journey to Jerusalem. On to the purpose of Romans. And for the purpose of Romans, we are dependent on different things Paul says within the letter itself. And what you will find is that different Pauline scholars sort of emphasize different verses of Romans or different passages in Romans uh, to greater or lesser extent. So depending on how much weight they put on particular passages, uh, they are going to then associate those passages with the overall purpose of Romans. So we're going to look at three different passages. I will read them out for, for us uh, in each case. So the first one is from the beginning of Romans, and uh, it's Romans 1, 14 through 16. 1, 16 and 17 is often called the thesis of the letter. So if, uh, if one thinks that this is sort of Paul's main point, if this is uh, everything in Romans is defending what is said in Romans 1, 16, and then into 17, uh, then, then this is sort of 
what Paul is all writing about. So he says in 1, 14 through 16, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Hence my eagerness to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So for those who are going to put the most weight on these particular verses, they're going to say Paul is writing Romans uh, to sort of really lay out his gospel. Now, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and now I'm going to tell you what my gospel is. So for those that emphasize these verses, Romans is really sort of a theological treaty that Paul writes out. It's a way for Paul to work out and communicate his theology, namely his gospel, in written format. Another place that New Testament scholars, Pauline scholars, often go to look for the purpose of Romans is Romans chapters 14 and 15. So I'm, of course, not going to read all of chapters 14 and 15 to you. Uh, but what Paul addresses in Romans chapter 14 and 15 is this issue of the strong and the weak. Uh, presumably, this has to do with uh, the way that persons are eating, their decisions about what they can and cannot or should and should not eat. And so in Romans 14, 1, Paul sort of uh, jumps into this section saying, welcome, uh, addressing the strong, he's saying, welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. And then Paul's going to sort of go into this long bit discussing the strong and the weak. And so for those who are going to emphasize these chapters as the uh, the place where we can find the purpose of Romans are going to say Paul is really trying to get at this issue of the strong and the weak to sort of work out some kind of conflict between these two different groups that either Paul has named the strong and the weak or the strong have sort of named the weak and by implication they are then the strong. And lastly, we have Romans 15. Uh, so here I'm going to read the first couple verses. We won't go through the whole thing. Paul says, But now with no further place for me in these regions where he had been working, I desire, as I have for many years, to come to you when I go to Spain. For I do hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem in a ministry to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. And so here we have two sort of different possibilities for the purpose. Uh, if we, we see two different things going on, the first is Paul saying, hey, I'm going to travel on to Jerusalem and I want you to send me on. That is to say, I want you to support me in my further travel to Jerusalem and then on into Spain. So you are sort of you Romans are going to be the one who financially support me. You're going to be sort of my launching pad for this next important uh, phase in my missionary journey. So the mission to Spain, which Paul has sort of been looking forward to, saying, I've done all the work I can't hear. I need to go, I need to go westward to Spain, uh, and you are going to be the ones that send me on. In this view, Paul writes everything he previously had written to sort of lay out his theology, maybe doing a little bit of theological treaty still, so that he can get support for this mission to Spain. Uh, the, other, the other possibility here is that Paul indicates in what I read that he's going on to Jerusalem, but later on in this passage, he, uh, he suspects or he indicates to the Romans that there is likely going to be some conflict in Jerusalem, or Paul is not sure how his offering is going to be received. So he has, he has this money he's going to bring to the uh, saints in Jerusalem sort of as a peace offering between the sort of Jewish faction in Jerusalem and Paul's Gentile gospel. And he says at the end of this passage here that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea, that is the unbelievers in his gospel, and that my ministry to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there, to the sort of Jewish, the Jewish party there. So the uh, it could be that Paul is sort of uh, in Romans, laying out his Jerusalem defense. And this would particularly make sense of Romans chapter 9 through 11, where Paul addresses uh, sort of the question of what relevance there is for Israel. Uh, has God forgotten Israel? 
by allowing the Gentiles to come in according to Paul's gospel. So it could be that Paul is sort of writing all of this up as a preparation for his defense in Jerusalem. This is sort of the stuff that he's going to say when he gets to Jerusalem to defend his gospel, and he's sending it ahead of time to the Romans either to get their support so that they're sort of on his side with respect to all this, or simply to just get it out there and to, to get a little bit of uh, practice, a little clarity of thought as he goes to defend himself in Jerusalem. So four different options for the purpose of Romans, and these are not mutually exclusive from one another. You heard me just a few moments ago say perhaps a little bit of theological treaty in the mission to Spain or in the Jerusalem defense. So we don't necessarily have to say it's this one and only this one. There might be sort of a mixture of these four or some different kinds of mixtures of these four. And there are purposes that are purported even beyond these four, though these are the four main ones that we'll find in Pauline scholarship. And lastly, for whom was Romans written? What were the people like in Rome that Paul was writing to. Uh, so we can get at this two different ways. Um, we can think about Rome generally speaking in the first century. We do have a good bit of archaeology, a good bit of literary evidence about what Rome was like in this time period. And we also do have some information about what Christians and Jews, or we can deduce some information about uh, what Christians and Jews were like in Rome. Um, and then lastly, we can look to Romans itself. Several names are mentioned at the end of Romans that might give us a sense of uh, what the sort of makeup of the individuals in the churches to whom Paul is writing, what, what they're made up of. So with respect to Rome in the first city, uh, sort of determining populations is very, very difficult in any setting. If you take a census today, it's still hard to determine a population. It gets even hairier when we are trying to determine ancient populations. But most likely, Rome is somewhere between a population of 500,000 to a million people which by the standards of ancient cities is humongous, a very, very, very large city. Uh, estimates about how many Jews are there uh, is somewhere between 20 to 50,000, so about 5% of the total population. Still, 20 to 50,000 is a really, really large percentage, uh, large uh, number of people. Even if it's a, a relatively small percentage of the total population, it's a very, very, very large group. And Paul is, of course, not right writing to all of these Jews in Rome. Rome in the first century is a very, very diverse place. It is sort of a melting pot par excellence. Uh, it is religiously diverse insofar as it is a polytheistic environment. Uh, you know, 95% of the population there would have been polytheists uh, worshiping a variety of gods and having sort of their, their favored few gods. Um, but these are going to be sort of not only the gods of Rome, uh, the Roman gods, uh, the, uh, sort of themselves are uh, come out of the Greek, uh, from the Greek gods, or are largely dependent on the Greek gods, but also sort of native and foreign gods. So Egyptian gods, um, gods from the East are going to be worshipped there. Uh, insofar as this is a demographic melting pot, people are bringing the worship of their god, their gods from their different geographies to the place of Rome. So Rome is going to be a really, really religiously diverse environment. Within this uh, Within this religiously diverse environment, we do see some sort of uh, fracture lines of tensions between uh, the sort of politics of Rome and the Jewish population. Um, and throughout the first century and throughout, you know, really the uh, several centuries before the first century and then beyond the first century, we sort of see these conflicts uh, with Jewish sort of imperial relations. They sort of go, go back and forth a bit, but we do have in the context sort of preceding the 56, 57 CE date, that Romans was written, we do have some things going on that seem to perhaps be of relevance to the letter of Romans itself. So the first thing is that in 41 CE, uh, it's it, there's a claim that Claudius has banned synagogue gatherings 
in the city of Rome. And this probably would have been somewhere between five to 15 Roman synagogues, maybe, maybe even larger given how many Jews are there. Um, but so Paul, um, purportedly, we have uh, synagogue gatherings being uh, shut down because of uh, because of sort of some political uh, tumult, as Cassius Dio will put it. So in his uh, Roman history, he says that as for the Jews who had again increased so greatly in Rome that by reason of their multitude, it would have been hard without raising a tumult to bar them from the city, Claudius did not drive them out, but ordered them while continuing their traditional mode of life not to hold meetings. He also disbanded the clubs, which had been reintroduced by Gaius. So Dio tells us that, uh, that Claudius is trying to sort of put a stop to Jewish gatherings in the city of Rome because of the increasing Jewish population. And then in 49 CE, we have the so-called Edict of Claudius, where Claudius seems to take a further step if these two sources are to, uh, to be believed. And it is of interest that we have two different sources, one biblical, one non-biblical, attesting to the so-called Edict of Claudius. So Suetonius, in the life, his life of Claudius, a, a biography of Claudius, says that he, Claudius, banished from Rome all the Jews who were continuing continually making disturbances at the instigation of one Crestus. So if Crestus looks familiar, it should. Uh, this very well may be that they are having some conflict about Christ, about name, about, about Jesus in some form or fashion. Um, there was already tumult beforehand, uh, several years earlier in 41 CE. Uh, Cassius Dio does not say it is about Crestus, but the tumult had continued, and it got to a point where Claudius uh, apparently had banished Jews from Rome, or at least Suetonius says as much, and Acts 18 also says as much, and sort of in an offhand way, which almost makes it more believable than if Acts were, had, were to have made a, a big deal about it. So Acts 18.2 says that after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy. So he had uh, entered into Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. So two different places uh, where we have independent attestation of one another that uh, Claudius has banished Jews from Rome. Whether it would be really actually possible uh, on the ground to get all 20 to 50,000 Jews out of Rome in this context uh, is hard to say, but we do have two different, uh, two different sources claiming that Claudius had banished Jews from Rome in the first century. And the reason that this is going to be relevant to Romans is it sort of leaves a, a vacuum as it were, uh, for uh, for Christianity um, in a in Paul's sort of form of it, we might say uh, Gentile Christianity, insofar as Paul's message is to Gentiles. Um, so, given if if this was actually enacted to the extent that Acts uh, and Suetonius claim that it was, and we do have a sizable population of Christians in the city of Rome, then it would seem to be that these are largely Gentile Christians, that the Jewish uh, sort of ethnicity of the Christians, uh, that is Jews who had come to believe uh, that Jesus was the Messiah and that his life, death, and resurrection meant something, were fewer in number than were the Gentile Christians, Gentiles who uh, believed things about Jesus' death and resurrection and their ability to worship the Jewish God on the basis of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That it would seem that Gentiles sort of outnumbered Jews within the Christian congregations. This leads us to this next slide here, Christians and Jews in Rome. Uh, just a reminder that Christianity is an intra-Jewish movement in the first century. We talk a lot in the introduction class, introduction to the New Testament class, about how we shouldn't necessarily think about Judaism over here and Christianity over here as if they're two completely different and separate spheres that are uh, different religions from one another in the first century world. Rather, we ought to think of Christianity, if we can even call it that this early. It's not a term that Paul uses. Um, 
uh, we have to think of it sort of within the sphere of Judaism itself. So it's one sub point within the larger sphere, uh, much wi wider sphere, the larger umbrella of Judaism. So Christianity is situated within Judaism, and within Christianity, Gentiles, via Paul's gospel, were able to worship the Jewish God without doing the sort of hallmarks of the law, eating certain foods, and uh, notably, especially for Paul, uh, being circumcised. So Gentiles are able to worship the Jewish God, and Paul is writing to a small, specific subset of God-worshiping communities in Rome. So if there were there were Gentiles who worshipped the Jewish God apart from Paul's gospel, um, what, what were called God fears, Paul is writing to a specific group of uh, God worshipping communities in Rome that were largely made up of Gentiles, though also probably some uh, some what we would call Jewish Christians as well. Uh, so Paul is writing to sort of we have if we have a large sphere, then we have a sphere within that sphere, and then maybe even a smaller sphere within that sphere. That's the one that Paul. That Paul is writing to. He's not writing to Judaism at large. He's not even writing to God-fearers at large, that is, Gentiles who worship the Jewish God. But he's particularly writing to those, uh, those who are Christians um, that have accepted something, that have uh, accepted the message about Jesus's life, ministry, death, and resurrection. And to sort of estimate what what this looked like as far as numbers go, we probably have somewhere between five and ten house or tenement churches. A tenement just means sort of like apartment churches. Um, and within this, uh, within these five to ten house or tenement churches, probably ten to forty persons per church. So that means we're looking at a number, if we do our basic math here, of somewhere between 50 persons to 400 persons that Paul is, is writing to here. And largely uh, based on what we're going to look at next with respect to Romans chapter 16, we're probably dealing with the lower to the middle classes. Uh, we get this information with respect to uh, the names and the titles of the people that Paul greets in Rome. And we get these greetings in Romans chapter 16. So in chapter 16, Paul mentions more names, by far more names, than he does anywhere else in any of his other letters. So we're not going to read out all of Romans chapter 16 here. Uh, if you want to, you could take a lecture pause here. I'm not going to put up the prompt. Um, but you could take a lecture pause, pause the video, and write down every single name that we find in Romans. You're going to find somewhere between 25 and 30. Uh, and what's really interesting is to write down their names and write down what Paul says about them. Something, some names he doesn't say anything about them. He doesn't append any more information. But many of the names he gives us more information about them. Um, and this is sort of uh, when you take the time to slow down and write these names down and see what is said about each one, it really sort of reveals something on the uh, on the minutia of whom Paul is writing to. So we get all of these different names, um, and I'm going to go ahead and give you that information that you might do in the lecture pause. Um, we're not going to go through all of them here, but these are all of the different people that Paul names. Uh, they are all slightly larger and in bold, and of course you will have these slides at your uh, available to you on the course uh, on the course page. But we get all of the people that are mentioned that are in Rome. These are the people to whom Paul is sending greetings. He's saying greet all of these uh, all of these people. Um, besides uh, the first one, Phoebe, who is the letter carrier, um, she's going to Rome. So then she will actually, she will be, in fact, be in Rome. Uh, but these are all the people that Paul apparently knows in Rome and knows something about. I put all of the people uh, who does, who Paul does not, um, who Paul doesn't say anything about. He doesn't give us any information uh, about them over uh, over here. These are all just names. Um, and then everyone else sort of gets something about them indicated. Uh, and some of, and sometimes they are sort of very uh, relevant and interesting things noted. And then these are all the people who are sending greetings to Rome. We get some information about them as well. And then down at the bottom here, I have broken up on the basis of names what we might gather about some of these people. And I should note... Um, very uh that this is very sort of tenuous 
anytime you are trying to extract data from persons' names, uh, whether that be ethnic data, social data, uh, that is a very fraught thing to do. And it's uh, lots of times it's filled with stereotypes. So this is, uh, this is by no means a science, but if we are to take sort of really stereotypical uh, criteria here and say, what does a male name look like in the ancient uh, Roman world? What does a female name look like? It looks like we have 27 males uh, mentioned here, nine females. If again, we are to uh, say that what is a typical Jewish name versus a typical non-Jewish name, it appears that six people that are mentioned in Romans chapter 16 are Jewish, 30 are not Jewish, are, are Gentiles. So this may in fact confirm uh, the fact that the sort of Gentile Christian population amongst the churches in Rome uh, outnumbers the Jewish population. And based on what Paul says about these persons, it seems that eight of them have a pretty close relationship to Paul, and nine of them seem to have some kind of leadership role, whether that be a leadership role in the church or uh, or sort of a civil leadership role. And six of these are, are women, which is uh, quite notable and important. All right, so I want to close us out by returning to our before and after lecture pause. At the very beginning of this video, I asked you to make some predictions uh, about the world behind Romans by filling in this prompt. I want you to do the prompt again, uh, recalling the information that, I, that we just put out there. So starting with Romans is a letter written, pause, and start to bring in some of this information about who wrote Romans, when it was written, the purpose for which it was written, and to whom it was written. And once you unpause, I'm going to come back on and give you my synthesis of what we have done here. All right, here it is. Romans is a letter written by Paul and the scribe Tertius in the year 56 or 57 CE to five to ten house churches in Rome that Paul did not found. Uh, these house churches consisted of 50 to 400 people total. The groups addressed in the letter were a mix of men and women, were ethnically diverse, though Jews appear to have been a minority, and they came from various social and economic rungs of society. Paul writes Romans to lay out or introduce his theology, seek support for his mission to Spain, and or address issues within the Roman communities.